Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the launch of Simon Fraser University Spring 2019 President Dream Colloquium on HIV AIDS from Cell to Society. We are fortunate to be here tonight on the unceded traditional territory of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh uh, peoples. Uh, my name is Robert Hogg, and I'm a professor here at Simon Fraser University and a senior fellow at the BC Centre for Excellence in HIV AIDS. I'm also the chair of this semester's uh, President Dream Colloquium, which means I have the ta tall task of being the MC uh, this evening, which I do not like, but I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm going to keep my remarks here brief and let us get to the incredible lineup of speakers, including Alda Glida Morgan and her daughter Jade, uh, SFU President uh, Dr. Andrew Petter, uh, Valerie Nicholson, <laughs> who seems to have quite a following, <laughs> uh, and Dr. Julio Montaner, and most, <laughs> who also has a following. <laughs> and most importantly, the art itself, which is in the back, and of course, uh, some refreshments. But I would, like to take, I would like to start by thanking some of the people with whom this exhibit and the colloquium itself would not be possible. First, uh, President Petter and the office, at, uh, office of the President at, at SFU, whose vision and continued support of, for this lecture series has helped to make SFU's Canada's most engaged university and a leader in innovation and research in HIV AIDS and beyond. I would also like to thank the members of SFU's Interdisciplinary Research Center for HIV, whose work and research are why we are here today. Uh, thank you as well to the SFU Graduate Studies Office, Dean and Associate Provost uh, Jeff Dickerson, and the team at the BC Center for Excellence in HIV AIDS for their incredible work in organizing this curriculum. Uh, thank you also to our partners, supporters, and sponsors, including Dr. Peter Center, a Youth Co., the Afro-Canadian Positive Network, and Positive Living. And finally, I'd like to thank the artists, many of them whom are here tonight and in this room, for their generosity and bravery in sharing their work for us. So thank you. Uh, we are at a critical moment in addressing HIV AIDS. We have made incredible progress as scientists and as community, exemplified by arts and experiences in this room tonight. But we have not done, we're not done yet. This past year we have seen global resurgence in HIV infections, even as the issue of HIV seems to be falling off both the national and international political agenda. Now, as much as ever, we need innovative strategies to reach those who are most vulnerable to HIV. We need powerful partnerships between community, academy, healthcare, politicians, and we need to listen to activists, scientists, and most importantly, people living with HIV AIDS. This spring, in a university course combined with seven public ex ex exhibitions and lectures from January to April 2019, Simon Fraser University is bringing together thinkers from around the world to discuss the most important issues in HIV AIDS today and tomorrow. Our speakers include leading activists, active, uh, advocates, researchers, service providers, and policymakers from around the world. Our goal is to inspire and mobilize the next generation of researchers, uh, policymakers, activists, artists, and advocates with an interdisciplinary understanding of the past, current, and future response to HIV, to the HIV epidemic. Having just met uh, some of the students tonight, I feel very confident in, in some of these uh, future uh, leaders. It is our hope that tonight, the art in this room invites you to consider the experiences of those living with HIV AIDS. We are launching the curriculum with this exhibit to recognize that HIV's impact on people and communities is a foundation to, of all science, research, care, and policy we are going to talk about throughout this spring. Please use tonight to get inspired and to be reminded of the importance of continued advocacy and activism. 
I would like to welcome Alder Gilda Morgan and her daughter Jade uh, for the land acknowledgement. I just want to say hello. Uh, my name is uh, Glida Morgan from the Sla'aman Nation, and it's uh, just such a privilege to be here amongst all you beautiful people, and I really appreciate being invited. And I have my daughter here, Jade. She's behind me. Come over here. <laughs> yeah. Hello, my name is Jade, and my native name is Ians, which means leaf, and I just, I'm honored to be here in front of you beautiful people, and I just like to say I'm so happy to be here and experience this amazing experience with you. It's quite far out there and makes me feel emotional in every way and possible, and it's just beautiful to be here in front of you beautiful people, and I hope you enjoy what we are about to offer and sing to you, and I'd like to acknowledge the land we are upon, which is Soil Tooth, Musqueam and Squamish Nation, and I am Siam Nation, and Kitsan. Did you get that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're acknowledging the Musqueam, Squamish, and Soil Tooth here for allowing us to have our beautiful event, the beautiful art, and all of the presentations on their traditional territories. And I'm from the Sla'ama Nation, as I said earlier, my mother's people. And the song that we're going to sing is a family song that was created by my niece, Brenda Hansen, and the elders of the Clahus Nation. And uh, Sandy Schofield had gone up there to create the song. And so I appreciate the honor of being able to sing it for you, Emote. Thank you, Emote Squigan. This sure is tall, this podium. <laughs> or I'm short. <laughs> uh, 
I guess maybe it's short for some people and tall for others. <laughs> Uh, but I would like to uh, thank you very much for a beautiful uh, welcoming. So I really appreciate that. Thank you so much. Um, I'd like to use this just to welcome uh, Dr. Uh, President Petter to give some opening remarks. Thank you so much. I'm sort of in the middle here. Uh, thank you, Robert, and thank you, Elder Glida and Jade, for that uh, wonderful welcome. We are indeed privileged to be gathered on the unceded traditional territories of the Squamish, Musqueam, and Tsleil-Waututh peoples. And I feel particularly privileged to be here to launch this semester, uh, the President's Dream Colloquium on the topic HIV AIDS from Cell to Society. You know, the Dream Colloquium was conceived back in 2012 as part of our vision to be Canada's engaged university. And the whole idea was to create a forum for interdisciplinary engagement amongst SFU students, faculty, and staff, as well as the broader communities we serve on issues that would be cross-cutting, that would be in, of interest to the broader university community and hopefully to the community as a whole. Now, it's called the President's Dream Colloquium because I put up the funding, but the real work, <laughs> the real work is done by the amazing faculty members who work together to come up with the ideas, the inspiration, the program, the speakers, to make each colloquium series possible. And we've had some fabulous colloquia over the years. We had one on protecting indigenous cultural heritage. We've had uh, colloquia on uh, women in technology, engaging big data, civil disobedience, not an untimely topic. Um, so uh, we've really benefited from the ideas and the energy that have been brought to these uh, series of speaks, uh, speakers and the ideas that they generate um, and not only is it speakers, but students get to enroll in the colloquium for credit. So this year we have students from diverse disciplines, including health sciences, biological sciences, chemistry, international studies, all who enroll in the colloquium, take the colloquium for credit, add to the program by asking uh, very penetrating questions and developing their own ideas in association with the colloquium topics. They not only learn from the faculty and the guest speakers, they learn from each other. And then we have creative uh, uh, faculty members who say, well, it isn't enough just to have speakers and student uh, learning. Let's add some other features. So we've had outdoor events. We've had indigenous ceremonial aspects. And I'm just blown away by the, uh, the uh, decision this year, which has obviously been, been so uh, successful to include uh, an art installation to bring artists who've been integrally involved in promoting awareness around HIV AIDS uh, into the conversation and for us to benefit uh, from their inspiration, their direction, their work, and how they've contributed to our collective education and understanding around this very, very important uh, public issue. Now, former students tell me that they really benefit from the colloquium. In fact, uh, I really like the comment that one student made. He said, it's like going to a field school without having to leave the university because we get to meet all these people and engage with them from outside the university, but they actually come to the campus as you have this evening. By promoting interdisciplinary, evidence-based dialogue on important topics, uh, we really hope this colloquium series will raise public awareness and will, in the spirit of an engaged university, contribute to action as well as understanding around the issues that the colloquium series addresses. Now, I'm really heartened by this semester's colloquium series, which is, of course, designed to provide perspectives and understanding on past, present, and future responses to a hugely important issue and one that I know has been the focus of much attention, but needs to be the focus of continuing attention, not only here, but globally, and that's the issue of HIV AIDS. Researchers around the world continue to make advances in the treatment and prevention of HIV AIDS, although I think we can take real pride in British Columbia because of the leadership that Julio and others uh, who've worked with him from SFU and other universities have shown in developing uh, real solutions, real strategies that can address uh, HIV AIDS, that can help uh, people who today can say that notwithstanding the fact that they have HIV, are able to live long and productive lives. But as Julio said on the radio this afternoon, as Robert uh, said to you just a few minutes ago, uh, that work is far from over. There's a lot of work that remains to be done globally as well as locally if we are to achieve the full potential uh, of the success that has already been achieved. 
And I know that, Julio, you say you're concerned that we're, we're losing some of that energy. So I'm hoping this colloquium series can help to build some of that energy and hopefully help to uh, uh, encourage further progress of the kind that, that you and Robert and others will be speaking about. Uh, I'm also very proud of the fact that uh, SFU, of course, has shown real leadership as a leading research university in the area of the study of HIV AIDS. Our HIV uh, Research Center brings together multidisciplinary researchers, creates partnerships to share knowledge and improve the well-being of living those, with, those living with HIV. And in fact, I remember about uh, oh, more than eight years ago when I first met Julio, and he said, you know, if we're going to solve this problem, it's not just going to be through medical breakthroughs. It's going to require people who have real social understanding, know how to work with communities, and can make some of the medicinal approaches work uh, for all populations and all peoples. And I know SFU has been a major contributor in, in that regard. So I am really looking forward to not only tonight, but the remainder of the colloquium series. Uh, I also want to say, however, that none of this would have been possible, reinforce uh, some of the credit that uh, Robert has already passed on to others, but deserves even more himself. None of this would have been possible without the leadership that he has shown and the faculty members that he's worked with to build this colloquium series and to bring us all together tonight and to promise us a very exciting series of lectures uh, in the ensuing uh, weeks and months. Uh, uh, there's too many members who've been involved for me to enumerate them, but certainly uh, the SFU Interdisciplinary Research uh, Center at H, uh, for HIV has been very much involved. Uh, also, I want to do a real shout out to our uh, Dean of uh, Graduate Studies and Associate Provost, uh, Jeff Dirksen, who's lurking back there, uh, and his staff, particularly Stevie uh, Benish and Stacy uh, Makratoff uh, from the Graduate Studies Office, who helped to organize uh, this uh, colloquium series as they do other colloquium series. Uh, this evening, of course, we're also going to be honoring uh, uh, Valerie Nicholson for the, the board chair of the Canadian Aboriginal AIDS Network, who is clearly well known to all of you because of your <laughs> earlier shout out, and justifiably so, and someone who I really count a friend, and I've learned a lot from myself, uh, Dr. Julio Montaner, who in addition to his many other attributes, including being a, the director of the BC Center for Excellence in HIV AIDS, is an SFU honorary alumnus. So I think that really should be probably at the top of the CV. Uh, and I know tonight we're going to talk about innovation, activism, and the arts, Vancouver's history in HIV AIDS. Uh, you want to hear them as much as I do, so uh, let me get out of the way. Uh, there will be an opportunity for you to share your ideas and questions during the question period of follow, and there will also be a modest, as befits a university of modest means, a modest reception held in the foyer after the lecture, which I encourage you to stay for. So with that, let me give you back to, uh, to Robert to provide an overview of the colloquium and to introduce our guests. Thank you so much for coming out this evening. Uh, thank you very much, President Petter. I would like uh, this opportunity to introduce our first keynote speaker of the night, uh, Valerie Nicholson. <laughs> um, Valerie, uh, who needs no introduction, <laughs> isn't... <laughs> oh, it's okay. I I've been given... Uh, Mia tells me to write all these things, so I'm going to... Uh, and I think, to be honest, it's a real honor to introduce you, so I'd just like to take two or three minutes, because you've done a lot, and so, if that's okay. You can, okay. Uh, is a, uh, uh, Valerie is an activist, artist, uh, which you can see back there, which I didn't know about until two weeks ago, so I'm amazed at your work. Teacher, researcher... Uh, and a proud, positive woman. She is the chair of the board of the Canadian Aboriginal AIDS Network, an Indigenous peer navigator for the Positive Living Society of uh, BC, among many other accolades. Tonight, we have the honour of hearing from Valerie and her experiences, her history, her art. Please welcome Valerie Nicholson. <laughs> Pictures. 
So thank you for that beautiful introduction. Um, I would also like to acknowledge, and I have nowhere to put my paper, and of course, bear with me for this writing because done in a true artist manner, it's on tons of paper. Um, I would like to acknowledge the territories that we're standing on, the unceded, ancestral, traditional, stolen lands of the Coast Salish people, which include the Musqueam, the Tsleil-Waututh, and the Squamish, and all those that live around the Salish Sea, which is right out this beautiful window. My GST name is Valerie. My given name four days after my birth was the one the Eagles watch over. I also was gifted a Diné name, which is Nodiwenda, uh, which means wolf eyes. And I'm Mi'kmaq on my dad's side. And like I said, I am living with HIV. I'm also the mother of four boys, four grandsons, and one granddaughter. And I'd like to also acknowledge the elders past, present, and emerging and always remembering those that have gone on before us and those that have been left behind. Welcome to Innovation, Activism, and the Arts, Vancouver's History, and HIV and AIDS. We all have the unique opportunity to be witness to this event. First, I would like to thank all of you for being here. I'd also like to thank my family, my son Danny, my daughter-in-law Jessie, my two grandchildren, which seats are empty, Bailey and Marcus, as they have gone off to a playroom because there's somebody from Camp Moomba there that is running that room and Camp Moomba friends are way more important than a grandmother. Um, I'd also like to thank my other family from Positive Living, Wendy and Lita, who are some of my biggest supports and watch out, these girls have got my back. My other family, Angela and Becky, who answered my texts at all off-hour times to say, does this look okay? Should I glue it here? I'd also like to thank my Chivo's family, because we're all family, and especially like to thank Megan and Mia, whose dedication and help putting on this event is just, I honor you. And also to you, Dr. Bob Hogg. Every time I saw you in the hall hallway, I heard, you can do this. So thank you for that encouragement and I raise my hands to all of you and thanks. So what is activism? So I had to Google it. And what Google says, because you know Google's always right, the policy or action of using vigorous campaigning to being about political or social change. Activism consists of efforts to promote, impede, direct, or intervene to make change. When we look at HIV activism, we can think back to Stonewall, to the Denver Principles. Maybe you heard about some of our peers carrying coffins to local politician offices advocating for medications. We saw die-ins at the art gallery. We, had it, we still have the AIDS walk, but back at the beginning, the AIDS walk, thousands of people used to walk for BCPWA. You may have seen the viral monologues. We've witnessed marches and protests. We've had silent protests turning our backs on the Federal Minister of Health in Washington, D.C. We've used media to make change, and we may have watched the Dr. Peter Diaries. We've also used media to make change. In 2007, it was brought to our attention about mothers not being able to afford baby formula. Mothers were falling through the cracks, especially HIV-positive mothers who could be charged with child endangerment if they breastfed their babies. At then, BCPWA, which is BC Persons Living with AIDS, Positive Women's Network, and Oak Tree Clinic and Loving Spoonful was seeing no change, so they put pressure on the government. With this pressure, they gave them the cost if a baby became infected with HIV, what the cost would be for the rest of that baby's life, both medical and mental. Still, there was no action from our provincial government. So this group of wonderful activists came up with a plan, telling the government enough is enough. Mother's Day was coming up, so they came up with two headlines for the provincial newspapers and gave the government a choice of which one we would publish. The first one was shame on the government for not supporting all mothers that need help with baby formula. Or, yay, government supports mothers that need formula for healthy babies. 
And I believe, and I'm pretty sure, today this program is still running out of Oak Tree Clinic. So thank you for that advocacy. We have fought for everything we have today. Some of us thrive living with HIV, but many of us do not. We face side effects from our medications and the damage it does to our bodies. And I'm very grateful and honor all those that fought that fight for free HIV medication for all of us. Yet today, we still face stigma and discrimination. And that can lead to self-stigma. And dis discrimination and self-stigma can destroy us. It is a huge form of bullying. We have always used art from the, almost the beginning of the two legates became on this Mother Earth. From drawing on cave walls, using rocks and stones to tell a story, and on the land. We've always been showing our passions and our messages. Today, we use social media, filming, for example, a mile in our moccasins. There's performances like Red, A Positive Day, paintings, are just a few of the ways we advocate for what we truly believe in. And there is a word for that. I didn't make this up. I actually went to Google, and please don't tell my doctor I'm using Google, because she's told me I'm not allowed to use Dr. Google anymore. <laughs> and the word is artivism, and it's an actual word. And the definition that Google gives us is the artivist uses their artistic talents to fight and struggle against injustice and oppression by any medium necessary. The artivist merges commitment to freedom and justice with the pen, the lens, the brush, the voice, the body, and the imagination. The artivist knows that to make an observation is to have an obligation. This is truly artivism. And we're never too young or too old to be an artivist. And one of the examples I'd like to give you comes from the leadership team at Camp Moomba, hosted by YouthCo. They were using their paint and words, and they came up with slogans like, fight the stigma, no judgment, include others, never give up, and one of my favorites, challenge by choice. And to hear these youth stand in a circle at the end of camp, and bring all the youth into a circle and say, talk to somebody. If somebody's diagnosed, bring them into our circle and don't you dare die. That day I couldn't stop leaking on the bus home. Tonight we all get to experience artivism in many different mediums. We have photo voice, paintings, photography, and expression. I invite you to explore, think, enjoy, and be part of artivism. There are masks on the back table, and we invite you to leave a message. Be part of this. It could be a message of hope, of love, of thanks, of caring, or this is what I want to do to make change. The other canvas is a memory board. As the pictures you saw of the crosses on the pictures behind me, we invite you to take the tongue depressors, which met to me represents our healthcare system to honor those that have gone on before us, too many, too soon. At the very front, just behind you here, we have body mapping. Body mapping is a form of art and narrative therapy used to gain a better understanding of ourselves, our bodies, and the world we live in. Jane Solomon and Jonathan Morgan from Cape Town, South Africa, developed the body mapping process. Body mapping was first seen as an advocacy tool to bring attention to the issue of HIV and AIDS in Africa. However, it rapidly became a tool for storytelling, helping people living with HIV to sketch, paint, and put their journey into words. The body mapping process includes drawing, painting, visualization, exercises, group discussion, sharing, and reflecting. The life-size body maps stand tall, vibrant, and proud. Body ma mapping takes us on a journey, and if you look at the body maps, at the left bottom-hand corner, you'll see where we came from. This are, is our beginnings. It could be our childhood. And to the top right 
It's what we're going for. Those are where we want to be. And along the middle are the struggles, the scars, the challenges, the successes. There may be tattoos, I don't know why. Vision for the future, accomplishments, and goals. You'll see a message. You'll see where they find their strengths. And you'll see a message to the public. And each day after the body mapping, they would also tell their story, which was documented. And this became part of the healing process. These body mappings, we are asking the question of criminalization. What it feels like to be watched, being under surveillance. How did they actually feel? Can you imagine how it feels to be continuously under surveillance? They say a picture is worth a thousand words. These words on the body maps, I believe, tell a thousand images. The law is bigger risk to us than HIV. Am I going to jail? Am I going to the morgue? I am strong. You are not going to break me. If I wanted to kill you, it wouldn't be through sex. And most important, I am not a sexual offender. You'll see a shadow underneath each woman's body map, and this re represents the supports. It shows us and they acknowledge all those that have supported them and held them up. They've been there when they've needed them the most. You'll see many different supports. You'll see doctors, friends, peers, elders, ceremony, traditions, family, and so many more. And some of them actually include their pets. On this art-based research, it could be difficult at times. There was lots of tears and there was laughter. And we had an elder with us that would debrief with us, sit with us, and give us lessons of how the paper now takes those emotions, that we don't have to carry them anymore. And on the very last day, the women weren't allowed back in the room. We set up all their body maps around because these were done on tables or the floor. And when they walked in, there was beautiful music playing and they had a postcard. And it says, when I look at the body map, and I'm going to use one of my favorite sister's name here, Phyllis, and when I look at Phyllis's body map, I see a strong warrior woman. And each woman would go around to every body map and put on paper what they saw. We even had to do our own, which was really difficult because a lot of times we don't praise ourselves. We're very good at praising others. And when we'd all finished that, the woman would sit in the chair of honor and each one of us would read our words to her. She would read her own and then she would take them home with her. So that any time you're struggling, you can look at those strength-based words and know we will make it. At the very back wall, there's a series of masks. Masks have been traditionally used in ceremony. And when a dancer wears a mask, they actually take on the actions and the persona of the animal that they're portraying. I want, you to, I want to take you on a journey of why I chose masks as my artivism medium. When I was very young, I was living on a farm. My mom, I don't believe she survived residential school. I believe she lived through it. And I would run away from home a lot. And I used to run away and watch Mungo Martin carve the tele or totem pole that you see here. And I'd also sneak into the parliament buildings. And I was a very young explorer, but something was always calling me. And I would explore down in the dusty rooms and go into rooms that probably never been opened in years. But something was always calling me. And I went into this room, and it was full of masks. They were all encased in glass. They were all set on black velvet. Yet they were crying to go home. They were taken way back when we weren't allowed to do potlatch anymore, when they took all our ceremonial masks. They were stored in the bottom of the apartment buildings, crying to go back home to their land and their people. I went home and talked to my family about it. I talked to counselor at school. And within two weeks, there was a big black car that came up to our farm and said, if you don't keep your daughter out of the apartment buildings, we will take your children away and you will lose your farm. 
I never spoke of those masks again, but I always remembered. Eventually, the government found these masks and made a great ceremony of returning them to the people that they belong to. I say, too little, too late. That is why my masks will never be put behind glass. They will always be open and full of life. The masks tonight are a journey of my experiences with HIV. From the pills that I take and the pills that I have to take because of my ARVs, because of side effects. And along the way, one of the ones I would like to talk to you about is the one that says judgment with the mask with the syringes. It has been, I think, 12 years, I'm losing count, I'm getting old, since that I've been an active drug user and I used injection drugs. Yet when I go to St. Paul's Hospital, my name comes up and I'm red flagged as a drug user. At first I didn't believe them, but I noticed a lot of times I was treated differently when it came to medications for pain and from different doctors and nurses. And I asked a friend that actually works there and she said, yes Val, your name comes up and you're red flagged as an addict. And one of the examples I'd like to give you, I had a very busy month in July last year. I was up at an ancient village of Quay where I broke my toe. Um, went to um, Cap Moomba, where making a lot of drums, I got a really good infection in my finger, and I was headed to Amsterdam to speak at the World Conference. I had no chance, I was coming home, I think I had 10 hours between changing suitcases. So I decided to go to St. Paul's to get a prescription for my infection in my finger. They said, you need an IV, and she went directly to my hand. I said, why are you putting the IV in my hand? It hurts, and they never work for more, longer than three to four minutes. She says, well, we have to put it there. And I said, no, can you please put it over here? She says, we don't put it over there. And I said, well, everybody takes blood from there. And I said, and I do get, and she goes, well, they are taking and I'm giving. And I said, well, you know, this is where I get IVs before because I can keep my arms straight. I said, my veins are deep and feathery, and I said, I know my body. So she went up here, and I see my grandchildren looking through the window. <laughs> and um, she went up here, and then she goes, well, I guess you felt that, didn't you? And I looked down, and she had actually gone through the vein, and it was just going bruised. And she walked away. Another nurse came in and said, do we have a problem here? And I said, no. She goes, where do you want me to put it in the IV? I said, I'd just like it right here. She's okay. And she goes, well, that went in without a problem, so what is the problem? And I said, I don't know. I don't have a problem. I just wanted my IV there. So then I asked if I could have a script because, and I told the doctor and I told the two nurses that I was traveling to Amsterdam later that night. So he walked in. He says, okay, I want you here tomorrow for an IV push. And I said, I'm going to Amsterdam. And he went, yeah, right. And he rolled his eyes. And I went, he says, you need to be here tomorrow at this time and we'll give you an IV push. And I said, I really can't. Could you please give me a prescription so that I can just go and I can travel to Amsterdam? He goes, okay. Puts his hand on his hip. If you're really going to Amsterdam, you can get your IV over there. We're not taking it out. So I looked at him and I said, okay, can you please give me what medicine that I'm going to be getting in the IV so that it is the same that I'm going over there. Can you tell me if I need more medical coverage? Um, can I get help finding out where the hospital is? And I said, do you think I'm going to be able to get through security with this in my arm? I'm going to be sitting like this for like, I don't know how many hours, 25 hours. And I said, I'm going to be missing a dose or two doses by the time I get there. And then I have to speak at the conference. And he looked at me and he goes, so you're really going to Amsterdam? I went, yep. And he goes, and you're speaking at the conference? I said, yes. Oh, I guess I can give you a prescription then. So why was I treated so differently? And then I think about it. Have I become complacent in my own health care? Have we all become complacent in getting our funding? We are seeing new infections every day. And we still see the criminalization, we still see stigma, and we still see discrimination. 
And what are you doing about this? Criminalization law needs to be changed, and many dedicated peers and allies are working on this. And in June of this year, a huge conference is coming to Vancouver. It's called Women Deliver. And in their program, we see that Prime Minister Justin Trudeau will be there, and his wife will be speaking, Sophie. So I came up with an ultimatum. If our provincial government guidelines on disclosure are not changed by this time, Leading the way is the WATCH study, which is the Women, Art, and the Criminalization of HIV, are organizing a protest. We are going to be loud, we are going to be proud, and we're going to show them that this is a Canadian stupid law. Sorry, it's on one of the body maps, and I think it's really stupid. <laughs> I invite you to join us um, and get back to your grassroots, your grassroots of activism to know that we are still here, that we are resilient, we are strong, and we are all warriors. We are still fighting for our lives. And I'd just like to end this with a quote from one of the quilts that I had the honor of seeing. And it's the quilt of friend Fred Rhyme, who left us in 1992, and his partner Bob Fullman, who left us in 1993. And they put this on their quilt. Here we sleep beneath the covers, but we are not at rest. Contained within this quilt is a packet of our ashes. Let it serve as a reminder to you, the living, that your work is not yet done. We urge you this. Find the cure, and when you do, come back to this panel and set us free. Tonight, I ask you to remember and honor the stories that are being told through artivism. And one day, I wish we could all say, I used to live with HIV. Nasamat, we are all one, all my relations, and thank you for listening. <laughs> Thank you so much, Valerie. Um, I would also like to take this opportunity to, to introduce our final speaker of this evening, Dr. Julio Montaner. Uh, Julio Montaner is the founding co-director of the Canadian HIV Trials Network, the director of the BC Centre for Excellence in HIV AIDS. Um, he was the founding head of the Division of AIDS for a decade in the Department of Medicine at UBC among many other accolades, especially, and most importantly, his honorary degree at SFU. <laughs> um, only a few actually got that, but that is the most important accolade. <laughs> it's an honor to have him here tonight. Thank you, Julio. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Bob, and thank you for the invitation to uh, uh, speak to you uh, guys today here. Um, I, um, uh, I'd like to uh, discuss uh, for you uh, briefly uh, the work that we've done at the center uh, over the last uh, three to four decades uh, that has come uh, to be known as treatment as prevention, uh, uh, originally a research hypothesis of ours uh, that uh, we work hard and, uh, and long uh, to ensure that it became a global policy. And I would like to uh, take it the next step and tell you a little bit about where we see this thing going uh, in the uh, next uh, 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 years to come. Um, as, uh, as I always do, I'd like to start with this slide uh, that basically tells the story, the early st story of the HIV epidemic in North America. 
Um, I arrived in Vancouver in 1981 from Buenos Aires, where I was from, I am from. And um, uh, at the same time that I was arriving here, uh, uh, unbeknownst to us, HIV was arriving into the continent. And uh, as you can see here, uh, HIV took off rather quickly. And for the first decade, a decade and a half, uh, we didn't know where this came from. We didn't know where it was going to end. And to be honest with you, uh, those were very difficult and trying times. Uh, uh, we had an opportunity to uh, become involved in the development of antiretroviral therapy. And uh, very early on, for a variety of circumstances, uh, uh, this basically changed my life. I abandoned my career in respiratory medicine, and I decided to dedicate myself uh, to developing antiretroviral uh, th therapy approaches. Uh, contrary to what many people believe, I'm not an infectious disease specialist. In fact, I don't even like infectious diseases, even, to be honest with you. Um, <laughs> Um, and, uh, and, uh, and so I, uh, I applied to this uh, uh, work, the only thing that I knew, which was uh, uh, tuberculosis uh, chemotherapy. Uh, and uh, those were lessons that I learned from my father, who was a, t a TB specialist. And uh, lo and behold, uh, similar to what happened with, H with uh, tuberculosis back in the day, uh, we were able to come up with a, a cocktail a triple therapy cocktail that ultimately proved to be successful. And uh, as you can see in this slide here, <clears throat> triple therapy uh, for the first time in uh, 1995 uh, was able to show uh, suppression of viral replication to levels that became undetectable uh, using a novel uh, approach, in this case ACT, the DDI, and nevirapine. Uh, this occurred at the same time uh, that colleagues in the United States working with Merck uh, showed that ACT, 3 tc and Indina, very different molecule, uh, was able to achieve similar results. So in 1995, a group of us came together, convinced by the clinical evidence that people treated with triple therapy not only had very uh, nice suppressed viral loads, but actually significant clinical improvements. Uh, we uh, decided to reprogram uh, our upcoming, uh, at the time, uh, HIV conference, the International AIDS Conference that, was, that we were hosting in Vancouver in, the, in July 1996. And that's when uh, we asked uh, Joe Average to develop this sprint uh, that became the face of the conference. Uh, and at the same time, uh, we used that opportunity to launch uh, triple therapy. Um, I recently had the opportunity to remind uh, Adrian Dix, our Minister of Health, that it was uh, during uh, the, their mandate that uh, uh, this uh, became a reality. In fact, if I remember correctly, Andrew, you were in uh, office at the time or shortly before that. Uh, and um, what you see here is that uh, upon us uh, implementing uh, treatment uh, broadly available uh, in the province, free of uh, charge for all HIV-infected individuals, we saw a very rapid decline in death among people engaged in antiretroviral therapy and a steady rise uh, in um, life expectancy, uh, which Bob actually has been monitoring over the years. Uh, he now tells me that an HIV-infected person uh, age 20 who is diagnosed immediately upon being uh, infected, uh, if they start in antiretroviral therapy immediately thereafter, uh, will be expected to have a near normal longevity, uh, uh, which is something that in the 90s uh, would have been unthinkable. While we were doing this work, uh, uh, we became interested on this particular s uh, phenomenon that you see here. Uh, we found that uh, while people were not dying from HIV at the rates that we uh, had been accustomed to, uh, and therefore there were more people living with HIV in our community, uh, yet uh, the number of new HIV diagnoses actually had fallen uh, uh, concomitant uh, with the implementation of our uh, antiretroviral therapy programs in BC. And this was happening at a time in which syphilis rates were going up, uh, we started to explore this issue uh, with Bob and a number of others, and we came up uh, with the notion that treatment was rendering people virtually non-infectious. And we outlined that uh, thinking in a paper that was published in The Lancet in 2006, and we basically said uh, that if we were to roll out antiretroviral therapy uh, uh, to ensure that every person infected with HIV had access to the treatment, uh, people would not develop AIDS, people would not die prematurely, and at the same time, for no additional investment, we could stop HIV transmission altogether. That viewpoint at the time uh, was uh, uh, largely uh, regarded as controversial, 
uh, we uh, unfortunately came up with this observation at the same time that the Harper government came into power, and so we had no traction federally, but we were fortunate that the province of British Columbia continued to support our work, and uh, not only that, but uh, instantaneously upon us launching this uh, notion, uh, we had tremendous support from Stephen Lewis, uh, who you are probably quite familiar with. Uh, uh, we were introduced to uh, President Clinton, uh, who immediately jumped on the bandwagon uh, and has been a very strong supporter of our work since then. And uh, this individual here, Nora Volkov, the director of the Na National Institute of Drug Abuse at the NIH, uh, who has not only been supportive intellectually, but also financially uh, for the work that we've done in BC to implement this program. And, and, and thanks to their support, we were able to, in collaboration with the provincial government, uh, to expand antiretroviral therapy coverage in British Columbia starting in the early 2000s. And as you can see here, uh, we have expanded uh, access to treatment ever since steadily and into, into today and actually into the future. And as a result of that, we have seen a remarkable decrease in AIDS incidence in British Columbia. This is uh, similar uh, to the first slide that I show you. The original one was for North America, for the United States. Uh, this one is for the province of British Columbia. And as you can see, while our epidemic took off a little bit later than in the United States, uh, it really took off very quickly when it did so. And as I said, into the mid-90s, things were looking really, really very grim. Um, upon us, recognizing the value of highly active antiviral therapy or the triple therapy cocktail, uh, the AIDS incidence declined, uh, but this decline was incomplete only when treatment as prevention became the norm. In other words, uh, we accelerated the role of antiviral therapy uh, to facilitate access to the treatment by all people infected with HIV. We saw a remarkable further decrease on AIDS incidence to the point that today, AIDS diagnosis in British Columbia are distinctly uncommon. So much so that May 31st, 2014, uh, we come, came together with uh, actually the United Nations AIDS program uh, to formally close the AIDS war at St. Paul's Hospital, mostly as a gesture to acknowledge the fact that if we were to do this elsewhere, uh, we could actually see the beginning of the end of the AIDS pandemic as we know it. Not only AIDS uh, uh, diagnoses were down, but as you see here, uh, 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 the new diagnoses have declined over time in British Columbia uh, in a way that is uh, uh, inversely proportional to the number of people that are taking treatment. In other words, uh, the more we treat, the less we diagnose. Uh, as we accelerated uh, treatment expansion, you see further declines in new diagnoses. And this is important to, re to, to recognize happening at a time in which we are uh, testing e exponentially more and more in the province. So in other words, it's not that we're missing the diagnosis, it's just that they're not materializing. It's also important to recognize that treatment is also the most effective way of preventing vertical transmission of HIV. It's 100% effective. So if we can actually make treatment available to everybody, uh, the vertical transmission epidemic should be a story of the past, as it has been in British Columbia for uh, nearly two decades. Uh, this gives you an update of the new HIV diagnosis in the province of British Columbia. As you can see, they have been declining steadily. Uh, the most recent estimate for the year 2017 uh, is 250 new diagnoses. Uh, the current estimate for this year is approximately 200 cases. Of course, uh, those numbers are still uh, being finalized. So we continue to see further improvements in the control of HIV in the province. When we started this work, uh, we advocated for the universal access to antiretroviral therapy by all peoples infected with HIV, regardless of their social, cultural, economic, or other circumstances. And most in particular, uh, we recognized that we needed to make treatment available to people who have concomitant ongoing use of intravenous drugs, a, a, a group that was particularly at risk uh, for adverse outcomes in our community. Uh, uh, colleagues around the world, including the United States, felt that this was irresponsible uh, because that they, they did not feel that people in those circumstances could be uh, reliable enough to uh, take treatment on a long-term basis. We argued that this was a shared responsibility and that strengthening the program would actually allow this to happen. 
As you know, British Columbia has been a leader in harm reduction programs, and as a result of that, uh, we were able to benefit uh, uh, from uh, uh, the benefit of antiretroviral therapy as well. Now, our uh, epidemic among uh, injection drug users uh, has been uh, extremely well controlled, uh, and in fact, it was one of the first successes uh, in our uh, expansion of treatment and prevention. And as I said uh, in, a moment ago, uh, largely this is due uh, to the interaction uh, between the harm reduction programs and the treatment and prevention strategy, uh, which are uh, uh, magnifying each other's benefit. Um, this is work by Bolan Nosek from SFU. Uh, he's a health economist within our group uh, who has basically been able to tease out the impact of harm reduction and treatment and show that both of them are actually synergistic when it comes uh, to decreasing age morbidity, mortality, and transmission. By this time, uh, you're probably wondering, well, all of this is very good news, uh, but uh, who is going to pay for all of this? And the answer to that is uh, shown in this slide. Uh, this is modeling work that was done by uh, a, a good friend of ours, uh, Ruben Granich, in collaboration with Brian Williams and others. And what you see here on your left-hand side uh, is the impact of expanding antiretroviral therapy uh, in South Africa uh, to progressive larger number of people to the blue line, which basically uh, illustrates treatment of prevention or treatment for all people infected with HIV. And what you see is that over a period of 40 years, uh, this would be estimated to save 5.5 million lives in South Africa. Uh, using uh, drug costs at the time in South Africa, these are generic drugs, uh, uh, Ruben Granich and Brian Williams went on to estimate would be, what would be the incremental cost of moving from very conservative approaches to very liberal approaches uh, of treatment prevention. And what you see here is that while there is an upfront cost illustrated by this spike here, uh, the spike is very narrow, and very quickly it, it goes down into sort of negative territory. What that means is that the more you invest up front in expanding antiretroviral therapy, the sooner you are going to uh, save money to the point that you will be laughing all the way to the bank. Uh, this would save South Africa in the order of $30 billion over the same period of time that they would have saved 5.5 million lives. This evidence was critical in moving the government of South Africa in the direction of treatment and prevention uh, in, in the recent past. And although what I show you is a mathematical model based on uh, African costs, which are generic drugs, uh, I'm happy to show you the real numbers uh, for the province of East Colombia. Uh, up to here, these are real numbers. And what you can see is the same behavior, although the numbers are different by the nature of the uh, different costs of drugs that we use and the different volume of patients that we have. But you can see is, yes, it costs a bit more going all the way uh, to treatment and prevention, but very quickly you're saving money. And in fact, British Columbia has not only been saving lives, saving infections, saving disease, closing the world, but on top of all of that, uh, we've been saving money as a result of this strategy already. The evidence that treatment and prevention works uh, has now been consolidated uh, through a couple of other pieces of evidence that I wanted to share with you. Uh, the, the first one is from Myron Cohen from 2011, uh, where um, uh, the NIH funded a very large prospective clinical trial uh, where zero uh, discordant couples, that is to say uh, uh, sexually engaged couples where one member of the couple is HIV positive and the other uh, member of the couple is HIV negative, were invited to join this study uh, and randomly assigned to immediate treatment with antiretroviral therapy or deferred treatment as it was the norm at the time. And what you can see here is that immediate uh, uh, use of antiretroviral therapy decreased the number of new HIV infections in over 95 percent. Uh, and in fact, the little bar that you see here represents only one infection that occurred among those that were taking treatment immediately, and that infection occurred at the time of randomization long before uh, uh, the treatment actually had the opportunity to act. So what this says is basically that once you are on treatment with antiretroviral therapy and your viral load becomes undetectable, you are no longer infections, you do not uh, transmit, which is extremely good news for everybody, those living with HIV, their partners, their families, and society at large. These results have been now uh, uh, furthered uh, by a, a study called a partner study 
uh, where a very large number of couples uh, were invited to participate in an observational study where the sexual practices were characterized in detail over time. I'm not going to go into all of the details, but you have heterosexual couples, you have uh, uh, homosexual couples, uh, you have all kinds of sexual practices included in this study. All of them have been fully characterized, and the bottom line is very simple. If the member of the couple that was infected with HIV was on treatment and the viral load was undetectable, uh, the likelihood of transmission was zero. In other words, uh, if you are undetectable, uh, you are not infectious, or the, what is now being called the U equals U campaign that has now been endorsed uh, globally, including most recently uh, by this paper uh, <clears throat> that was uh, sponsored by the Public Health Agency of Canada uh, to review the evidence to basically arrive to the conclusion that yes, indeed, all of the evidence confirms that treatment as prevention is 100% effective at preventing HIV transmission. As a result of all of these developments, uh, Michel Sidibe, the Executive Director of the United Nations AIDS Program, uh, a number of years ago, um, uh, challenged us, me in particular, uh, to come up with a new uh, uh, rollout goal for antiretroviral therapy globally, uh, with the expectation that we could build on the experience of British Columbia uh, to um, direct the efforts globally uh, to duplicate our experience in the rest of the world. And to make a long story short, uh, working together with uh, Bob, uh, Viviani Diaz Lima, and a number of others in our team, uh, we came up with this uh, global target that is called the 90 90 90 target, uh, uh, which basically says that by 2020, uh, we expect that the, the globe, every region in the world, uh, will aim to have at least 90% of the people uh, diagnosed, at least 90% of those uh, on antiretroviral therapy, and at least 90% of those. Uh, fully suppressed, uh, because in achieving uh, this 90-90-90 goal by 2020, uh, it would lead uh, to a 90% decrease in AIDS death by 2030 and a 90% decrease in new HIV infections by the same time, which virtually meets the definition of ending AIDS as a pandemic disease. It's not the end of AIDS, it's not eradicating AIDS, but it's basically ending the pandemic as we know it. We took this news everywhere, uh, from the Vatican uh, to the United Nations, and I'm happy to tell you that uh, we can be pretty compelling when it comes to it. Uh, we got full support from everybody. So we wonder uh, uh, why this question? Well, it's very simple. Uh, uh, can we meet the end of AIDS? Yes, we can. Will we? I don't think so. And that's the bad news for today. Uh, this is the most recent data uh, released by the United Nations AIDS program uh, uh, December 1st of uh, this year past. And what you can see here is that globally we have seen, in contrast to what we've seen in British Columbia, very slow progress. Uh, here you have the number of AIDS-related deaths that have been identified, and yes, there has been an improvement, but we're nowhere near where we need to be. In fact, uh, this is the target for 2020 if we meet the 90-90-90 target. And you can tell that this line is not going anywhere close uh, to that dot. So we have a problem there. When it comes to uh, HIV infections, yes, there have been a decline, but again, we have a problem. This is where we need to be by 2020. Uh, this is not happening. Uh, this is, there is no way that we're going to meet those targets at the rate that we're currently going. And the reason for that, well, it's very simple. Uh, uh, you see here, uh, we came out with the notion of treatment prevention in 2006. That was the last year that we saw an increment on the uh, investments on HIV AIDS globally. At this rate, we're not going to meet the 1990-90. In fact, we're going backwards. You see here that uh, AIDS investments have virtually remained flat. If you adjust this for inflation, you know, we're going backwards. And everybody has a favorite country, and you're going to ask me the question. As you can, I cannot remember this table. I just put it there uh, for you to uh, have a sense that the picture is not looking particularly encouraging. Yes, there are countries that have seen decreases in the trends of new HIV infections among adults. Uh, there are a whole host of countries that have seen increases, in some of them increases of 50% or more. Uh, this is unacceptable at a time in which every single member country of the United Nations has signed on formally 
to the 90-90-90 target. It's easy to sign on to it, it's hard to do it, and most people are not doing it. So as the architect, if you want, of the 90-90-90 goal, I'm here to tell you that when it comes to ending AIDS, yes, we can do it. When it comes to doing it, I'm not sure we're going to do it uh, because the political will is simply not there. And we're going to continue to uh, push for it, but uh, we'll need your help. We need everybody's help if this is going to change uh, because, unfortunately, uh, political leadership around the world, uh, including in some areas of this country, is becoming more and more insular, and they're failing to recognize that global problems can only be addressed with global strategies. We cannot uh, stop climate change, uh, migratory trends, uh, uh, wars and uh, global unrest or pandemics if we all care only about our own backyard. So we need to make wise global investments if we're going to end that. And treatment of prevention is a, a smart global investment that we have now committed to. We have normative guidelines around the world that support it. We have political commitments that say that we're going to do it, all we need is the financing. So in closing, uh, I, I think we have learned a great deal regarding the potential role that treatment of prevention can have uh, in order to drive an effort towards targeted disease elimination of selected conditions, HIV being the case in point. And uh, we have also learned how this can contribute to healthcare sustainability. More importantly, uh, we have come to recognize that if we have a situation where a disease is driven uh, by the prevalence, in other words, in any infectious disease, the more people living with a condition, the more likely you are going to have increased transmission and therefore increased incidence. So what we have un un understood through this exercise is that in this situation, if you decrease prevalence, you decrease incidence, and in doing so, you contribute to increased healthcare sustainability. This applies to every single infectious disease. And to be perfectly honest with you, uh, uh, all we've done is we modernize and uh, re-energize the so-called Stop TB campaigns that my dad and others uh, were involved in the 50s and the 60s. Uh, but these are actually can play for every single one of them. And we are anxiously awaiting uh, announcements from the provincial government uh, regarding the expansion of our Stop HIV initiative uh, to uh, uh, viral hepatitis, specifically hepatitis C, which we hope is going to come pretty soon. The angle that has not been exploited yet is the potential use of this strategy uh, to deal with socially contagious diseases. Uh, we refer to those as diseases where uh, prevalence drives incidence, and this applies to situations such as smoking-related diseases, obesity-related diseases. Uh, 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 if you start thinking about that, the, the number of conditions that are amenable to this kind of approach is huge. Anything from type 2 diabetes uh, to atherosclerosis uh, to premature uh, heart attacks, uh, stroke, uh, uh, diabetes, as I mentioned, uh, uh, COPD. I mean, the list is enormous, including perhaps even addictions. Uh, of all kinds. So we are currently working with a number of partners, including Diabetes Canada and others, uh, to expand uh, uh, the, the vision of treatment of prevention and targeted disease elimination to not just only HIV and infectious diseases, but other socially contagious diseases of high burden. And I'm happy to tell you that these efforts are going forward quite successfully. So on that note, I want to thank you for your attention and for the privilege of welcoming me back uh, 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 to SFU. Uh, uh, to open this colloquium. Thank you. We have uh, a few minutes for questions for uh, Julio or for Tom.
think we can divide the, the talent from the rich country. Also, I don't know the internet would be useful for presenting. Um, uh, that's not my area of expertise, uh, but I know of a lot of work that has been done uh, to uh, exploit uh, the um, social media uh, to reach uh, uh, those individuals that are harder to reach through other means. And I have no, uh, no doubt that this can play an important role uh, on, the, on securing that kind of access. Uh, there is uh, a lot of interest on using every possible uh, means uh, to spread the word to people who are most in need uh, to access testing, treatment, care, and other forms of support. So the answer is yes, we cannot afford leaving any tool in the toolbox at a time in which uh, the stakes are so high. Um, you know, uh, one of the persons that has been most influential on advancing this kind of thinking has been Jeffrey Sachs, uh, who, as you know, uh, is a very prominent economist uh, in the United States. And, uh, and, and I agree with you. Uh, um, uh, we need to make every possible argument uh, to advance this discussion forward. Uh, the economics of it are incredibly clear. Uh, the issue is how do we reach those that are in a position to make these decisions so that they actually can make the best informed decision based on these data. And uh, I, I agree with you, uh, reaching outside of the biomedical sphere uh, is critical uh, to ensure our success. Not just the public at large, but uh, targeted approaches in, involving, as you said, for example, economists, uh, political scientists, etc., uh, that would be an, a critical new addition to this kind of forum. I'm just wondering, you know, did that involve the treatment as prevention approach? And then do you see any other kind of political leaders internationally at the forefront of doing a similar kind of investment? Or people do you think, you know what, I'm optimistic about their kind of leadership on this issue? So um, PEPFAR has played a tremendous role in moving this agenda forward. And uh, the current leadership at PEPFAR has been uh, incredibly supportive, personally uh, uh, and, and, and programmatically, uh, of the strategy that I'm describing for you here. The problem is that their funding has been flat too, uh, if not contracting. And, and so while um, everybody's been very polite talking about the fact that we're trying to do more with less and increasing efficiencies or whatever, I think the, the slide that I showed you with regards to the money uh, speaks volumes. Uh, 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 the, the line has been basic, basically flat uh, since 2008. Yes, because of the recession, but we, we, the recession came and went, and, uh, and then basically we never revisited the AIDS funding. Uh, the Global Fund also plays an important role, uh, and the Americans uh, contribute significantly to the, to the Global Fund as well. Uh, but unfortunately, countries have not been keeping up with their commitments, and in fact, uh, and not only the commitments in some instances are shrinking, but act actually people are, are leaving the field altogether. Um, the Trump phenomenon has not helped, uh, but he's not the only guilty party. There, there, there are guilty parties so, uh, all around. There is plenty of blame to uh, distribute around. Uh, so it, it, we won't, things won't get fixed if we fix the U.S. Uh, uh, federal situation. Uh, uh, we are going to need a, an increase in the uh, level of public anger uh, for the fact that we are subscribing to these strategies and not delivering on the promise. Uh, basically, enough is enough, and uh, I feel that I have an obligation to come clean and say, look, this is no longer acceptable. Uh, what about, um, you know, this is Berkeley, where it's Columbia, but what about the 
about the other provinces and territories uh, in Canada, uh, especially uh, places like Saskatchewan? Well, as you know well, uh, uh, the situation in the rest of the country is quite uh, um, uneven. Uh, uh, British Columbia had uh, the worst epidemic back in the 90s. Uh, uh, today we have probably the best control epidemic in the country. And that's not for lack of uh, trying on our part. Um, Irene Day was with me when I met with Tony Clement in 2006. Uh, he was the Minister of Health at the time. And all he could tell me was that uh, our actions were um, despicable. That He didn't use the word, but uh, because we were uh, uh, really promoting conducts that led to further expansion of the HIV epidemic. Uh, now he's where he belongs. Uh, but uh, having said that, um, <laughs> sorry, Tony. Uh, but having said that, uh, that lack of leadership federally is the reason why this epidemic is not under control. And although I must admit that the Trudeau administration has taken a different approach altogether, uh, the fact that the uh, health is so fragmented across the country uh, allows uh, for different policies to take place in different regions and really we're failing to learn from others' experience in terms of implementing the best available evidence in the rest of the country. So in Saskatchewan, children are still being born with HIV and that's not acceptable. And to be honest with you, uh, I think the answer is political. Uh, the, there is no political will to do the right thing. Uh, they keep on uh, throwing their arms up and saying, well, this is too much of a problem, and therefore we're going to do nothing about it. Sorry, I, I'll take two more. One, two. I, I, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> it, it's not very often that I give that as an answer, but I honestly don't know. I don't know what else to do uh, to motivate our political leadership. And I'm going to defer that question to Professor Andrew Petter, a reformed former politician uh, who may have different insights regarding, <laughs> <laughs> regarding what can we do to motivate our political leadership uh, with regards to this. I just don't know what else to do. Uh, we, we, we've been across the country, we've been across the world uh, to try to motivate people, and it's, it's very challenging. Uh, all I can do is keep at it and, uh, and hope for the best. But if anybody has different ideas or better ideas, I'll be happy to learn. I'll take one final question. Terrible. <laughs> uh, you know, you're, you're, you're. Yeah, I don't have the statistics at the tip of my fingers, but I, uh, but I can tell you that uh, uh, access to medicines, uh, particularly life-saving medicines, is a challenge. And uh, uh, you know, in HIV, uh, we have been privileged uh, to have the support of the provincial government. I notice I'm not using any denominations because we've been supported throughout uh, 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 the history of the epidemic. Uh, uh, the, basically, we've been told, look, as long as you can prove that you're doing the right thing, run with it. Now, having said that, the anti-nausea medication for people who are nausea with the antiretroviral therapy it may not be covered, and uh, that creates challenges uh, uh, as well. 
So, you know, we keep uh, on hearing about a pharma care plan. Uh, uh, hopefully, we'll see one uh, before my days are over. Uh, I, don't, I don't hold a lot of hope that it's going to be of the caliber that uh, we would like to see it, but we see. Uh, uh, access to medicines is a major stumbling block. And no, it's not just medicine, uh, but it's the package, the, the health care package and the access to health care services that are required for people to benefit from those medicines. And that's where treatment prevention has made a difference. Thank you. Uh, before I say uh, my closing remarks, I would just like to give an opportunity for questions for Val. Um, if nobody has questions, I will ask several of her. <laughs> so we better not start there. But so please, is there anybody that has questions about her uh, work and her, her talk? Yes. Oh, Val, please come up here. I don't want to uh, answer your questions. <laughs> Are you talking about the criminalization? So we have actually have a co uh, the Canadian Coalition to Reform Criminalization. So we're working with the uh, Legal Aids Network and we have been lobbying um, provincial. We have members from all provinces. So we have met with the federal minister where we've made change, or they've made change, listening to us. But unfortunately their guidelines only um, govern the territories. Um, so we have a big fight on our hands still to change each provincial law. And um, we just put the word out to build that community and we have so many allies willing to work with us on this. And um, the fight's not over and we're still working on it. Thank you for that question. Oh. <laughs> Okay, I'm going to answer that through a story because I am traditionally a storyteller. So we did have a meeting with, <laughs> sorry Angela. <laughs> um, so we did have a meeting with um, David Eby, who met with us and approached um, those that wrote the guidelines for the sex too, to actually meet with all the HIV organizations to get this data before they put, us up, put it out. So we met with him, say, I can't remember what day it was, probably on a Tuesday, Wednesday, the sex two guidelines came out. So they didn't even, well, he says they never consulted him. I don't know the true stories. But we had a meeting with um, the prosecutorial services, and we sat at a table, and there was a lot of representation. And I see some of them here um, who probably remember a lot more than I did. But what I wanted to ask them, what do you mean by reasonable risk of transmission? Because it's not defined. And everyone's definition of that is different. Yours is different than mine. So I asked him to explain it to me, and he says, read the document. So again, I asked him the question, can you please tell me what you mean by reasonable risk of transmission? And he said, read the document. So I'm sitting there, and we have a fabulous ally here in Vancouver by the name of Michael Vaughn, who is a lawyer. And she turned to them and said, Valerie is asking you a very clear question. Please define what you mean by reasonable risk of transmission. And he turned and looked at me and he goes, I'm a lawyer, not a doctor. So does that answer the question? Yep. <laughs> I was going to say that's the answer I thought you were going to 
but yeah. And my response, or our response was, so why did you write it? Okay, thank you. I will keep my remarks uh, short, but I just want to thank Julio and Val for their talks today. I, I, I was honored to hear them, and it's great to have you here. I think it is also with having President uh, Petter also introduce us today in terms of supposed to the importance of SFU, SFU being an engaged university. And I think what we learned tonight, the importance, whether you're a researcher or a community member, the importance of activism. And so I guess we have an obligation as community members and researchers and whoever we are uh, to go back to that quilt uh, in terms of one that Val was talking about where the ashes are stored uh, for us in terms of whether that means getting um, a cure or really ending AIDS so we can release them. And so I think that activism is not over and the importance of engagement is not over, that we really need to, to strive towards that. And as we can see today, we have a long way to go and it's not over. So with that, I would just like to thank everyone for being here uh, tonight and also uh, take an opportunity to meet some of the artists that are in the room. Uh, some of them are quite shy and may not want to speak to you, but you have an obligation to go to speak to them. Uh, so please uh, take that as an opportunity. And also there is uh, modest refreshments in the back. <laughs> uh, so please uh, uh, enjoy them. So thank you all for coming. And